Hi, and welcome to Talking Wildfire with Michael Hill. Today, we're talking with Conway Bowen again, and we're talking about followership. We're doing a deep dive into the skills of good followership. And something unique that I've learned a long time ago in firefighting, especially with the jumpers, is sometimes we have to stand up to be a leader, and sometimes we have to step back to be a follower. And both skills are important, but the followership is the one that keeps everything working together. And Conway, can you tell us about followership? Okay, thanks, Mike. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's very interesting that you should say that about stepping up to be a leader and then you know stepping down to be a follower. Followership is an actual skill. But it's interesting to note that there is no such word as followership. Uh, you won't find it in the dictionary, but you understand the concept of it. It's the ability to be a good follower. And I think that's a very important skill to have because leadership training is very difficult. Uh, leadership is all about inspiring people, and it's hard to train a person to be inspirational. And the other thing is that we need more followers than we need leaders. So maybe we should start concentrating on looking at training followers to support a designated leader. And that's the, the onus or the crux of my training. There's lots of leadership training out there. Some of it is excellent, really, really good. Um, but we, I think we are selling ourselves short when we don't concentrate as well on good followership uh, capabilities and characteristics. So my no stopping for teams technique is actually directed at followership training, how to support a designated leader. Yeah, that sounds excellent. Can you tell us about your training? Uh, sure. I've got some slides here. If you're happy for me to go through the slides, we can actually talk about leadership and the concept of leadership uh, through the last, say, 120 years. And then I'll go into what I think is a definition of leadership compared to other definitions, and then into the no stopping for teams technique and looking at followership. But before we do that, we look at uh, the characteristics of a leader, such as personality types and the different ways of leading as well before we get into the followership. So I'll just share a screen with you at the moment. And this is the, uh, the presentation that I, I give uh, for my no stopping for teams leadership uh, followership training. Okay, we have a, a very proud-looking uh, Il Duce Mussolini on his on his balcony in Rome. So, one of the the precepts that I have is that it's you can't train leadership. Well, that's not exactly true. Of course, you can train leadership, but the key thing about leadership is inspiration. And so, we'll get onto that in a second. But first, let's have a look at different forms of leadership through the ages or what the concentration was when looking at leadership. So starting at the beginning of the 20th century, we saw that during the, the first two decades up until the 1920s, leadership was more concerned about the control and centralization of power, both at the organizational level as well as at, say, the national level. And this was the rise of the uh, the big governments. And we saw the... the uh, the Russian Revolution in 1917, we saw that the rise of some of the big companies as well. Uh, and those big companies, of course, became very powerful in the early 20s. And of course, that led to the, the stock market crash, the Wall Street crash in 1929, when there was such a boom in uh, the economy. And so during the hard years of the 1930s, during the Great Depression, we now started to look at people who could make us feel better and look at their personality traits. So we had in the United States, we had Hoover, we had um, the Roosevelt, um, and of course, Roosevelt uh, suffered from polio. So he, he was in a wheelchair, um, but we didn't have the, the uh, media coverage back then. We had him talking to people in the United States uh, over the radio, his fireside chats. And then when he did travel around to campaign, they minimized his, uh, his requirement to be in a wheelchair because they didn't think that that was something that befitted a great leader. So we looked at their personality traits in the 30s um, and the image that they would portray to the followers. During the 40s, we looked at how leaders behaved whilst leading a group. So the 40s, we're looking at the Second World War. We're looking at national leaders, again, say Roosevelt and how he, he, he led the United States. 
Churchill, how he led Britain, and in Australia we saw Menzies and then Curtin. So the uh, the leadership at the national level, right down to leadership in the military, Eisenhower, um, Montgomery, those great generals, and how they led their people, and then right down to the individual leaders, say at unit level, some great leaders down at the battalion level, and those sort of things. So the concentration during the forties was how leaders managed and led a group. During the 50s, there were multiple themes that emerged, what leaders did when they were in a group, and the relationships between the group and developing shared goals for the group to achieve. And lastly, the ability to influence uh, a group and the group's effectiveness. And that, that theme, that influence theme started to permeate from the 50s and still uh, exists today when we look at leadership uh, definitions. During the 60s, uh, the flower power era, uh, was the common goal was the, the common theme was influencing others towards a shared goal, and that's basically maintained for the last 50, 60 years. In the 1970s, we saw the, the rise of the big corporations, the multinational corporations, the emergence in the late 70s of the yuppies. So everything was corporate centered or corporation centered. And so leadership started looking at organizational behavior how CEOs operated with, with boards of directors uh, and that sort of concentration when it came to leadership training and leadership uh, science. I don't, shouldn't say it's a science, it's more of an art. Leadership is an art. So leadership definitions, there's been a number of definitions, but there's one common one that seems to, uh, to permeate these days. So the Rural Fire Service, the wild firefighters in the state of New South Wales and Australia, have a good definition in their manual because it, I say it's good because it looks at three different aspects of leadership. And you can see the quote there on the screen. Leadership is, effective leadership depends on the characteristics of the leader. So that includes experience, the skills and the personality. And we'll talk about personality in a moment. The characteristics of the crew. So we're talking about fire crews at the moment. The mood of the crew, their motivation and their competence. See the training comes in there. You can't have a, a, a competent crew without good training. And the characteristics of the situation. Now, in my uh, Sparrow Call decision-making uh, video we did the other day, the interview that we did, uh, Mike, you might remember that I talked about a problem sitting on three key dimensions, the complexity of the situation, the time available to solve the problem, and the resources available to solve the problem. So this really dovetails nicely with the RFS's idea on on leadership because it depends on the leader, the crew, and the situation. And they've got the situations there of time constraints and difficulty, exactly what I, I consider to be the, def the dimensions of a problem. Now, in the Australian Army, they divide leadership training into four key dimensions that they assess. So the definition of, of leadership in the Australian Army is, as you see on the screen there, it's the process of influencing others in order to gain their willing consent in the ethical pursuit of missions. And the choice of words is very important there. So it's influencing others. That's the theme that we're looking at with leadership. Gain their willing consent. Because if you don't have the willing consent of your followers, then what you're doing is coercing them to do something. And then the last part there is the ethical pursuit of missions. It used to be just group goals. Then they found that it's better to put in ethical pursuit because there is a difference between a legal command and an illegal, illegal command. And so the ethical pursuit of missions is put in there to help guide followers to understand that they have a, a duty and a responsibility to ensure that what they're doing is ethical, sound, and legal. So the training of leaders is divided up into uh, to four dimensions upon which they're assessed. It starts off with command. So command indicates that you have some sort of legal authority to put people or to, to uh, compel people to do something, including putting them in harm's way. So in the United States, you have the Uniform Code of Military Justice. In, in Australia, we have the Defence Force Disciplinary Act, the Defence uh, Legal Manual to help with guide that. So a commander in the military has a legal authority to compel subordinates to do something. You don't find that in civilian organizations. So that's a unique part of leadership within a military context. And so when we use the word command, 
it can actually have a meaning that's different to how people understand it. And it's important to, to, to um, acknowledge that. The second part is the leadership, and that's what we've been talking about, the influencing people in the pursuit of a group goal. And the third part is management. So management is basically it's economics. It's the distribution of limited resources amongst competing and unlimited wants. It's how do you manage your human resources? How do you manage your financial resources? How do you manage your physical resources, such as machinery, vehicles, whatever it is that you require to do your job? So that's the management part of it. And the last part is the training. How do you pursue training of your teams to make them into a competent and cohesive organization that you can then use and influence to work towards the group goal? So when they assess leaders, they assess them in those four key dimensions. So what is leadership all about? Well, inspiration is that word that keeps on popping up. You're inspiring people. So a good question is, what does inspiration mean? Well, literally, inspiration means to breathe life into something. So the, the spear part of the inspiration is the same cognate where we get the word spirit or animus, the things that makes us do things, that animates us, so spirit. So when you inspire someone, you're putting spirit into them, you're putting motivation into them. The opposite to inspire is expire. So when your spirit leaves your body, you expire. You, when you breathe in and out, you respire. That's respiration. So that's going in and out. That's respiration. So that's where the, the concept comes from, the etymological origin of the word inspiration. We're breathing spirit into something. Then we have to influence others. So the, the flu part of that comes from the word flow, the cognate for the word flow. So if you have two rivers joining together, it's called a confluence, two flows coming together, confluence. So influence means making something flow into something. We're getting that motivation flowing into a person. So we're influencing people and we're inspiring people. Uh, ins inspiration is about the spirit. Influencing is about the motivation that comes from that. Now, the other key concept about leadership is that you need followers. So a leader needs followers. Otherwise, it's just a lonely person talking to himself. And it needs, uh, so a leadership needs a leader to inspire and influence followers. That's what leadership is all about, a leader to inspire and influence followers. So my version of leadership actually takes the best from all those different uh, definitions and methods. Uh, and But before I give you my version, I need to explain sympathetic resonance. So sympathetic resonance, if you get two tuning forks and they are exactly the same tone, say key of G or G, you bang one and it will start to ring in the, uh, the tone of G. If you put the other tuning fork right next to it without touching it, it will start to vibrate and will start to make a tone as well because it can sense, it feels the, that vibrating air and then will uh, will resonate in sympathy with it. So sympathy actually comes from the Greek meaning the same. Sim means the same and pathos means a feeling. So when you are sympathetic someone, you have the same feelings as a person. Resonance, re means returning, and the son air means sound, so it's returning sound, it's the echo. So sympathetic resonance is the returning sound that is the same. So when we look at good leadership, what we want is to be able to get people to feel the same that we are and to return that to us. So the IPAS, uh, IPAS version of leadership is, as you see on the screen there, it's being able to induce in a group Induce, remember, we'll put there induce, that's that influence, the same feelings and motivations as the leader to echo his or her ideals and to influence and inspire them to move towards achieving the organizational common goals. That's the IPAS definition of leadership. Slightly different to the others, more or less the same, but there are some minor, minor changes there. So when we start looking at um, leadership and followership, um, we have to consider a person's personality. Some people, they say, are naturally natural born leaders. Other uh, people, they say, sometimes are natural followers. Um, and I'll just make one mention there. In, in our culture, in the Western 
individualistic culture that we see in, in America and we see in Australia and other Anglo-based um, cultures. The term follower has a pejorative, con um, pejorative term, um, uh, meaning. To call someone a follower is usually is a derogatory term, when in actual fact, a follower is a very, very powerful position to be in because without followers, a leader is nothing. So if you are a follower in a team, there are certain characteristics that you can display that will make you an incredibly useful and incredibly powerful component of that team. And that's why the no stopping for teams technique has been developed to concentrate on exactly that. And it also depends a lot on a person's personality as to how they're going to be um, performing as a member of a team. Some people don't like to follow others. Uh, other people are very, very happy to do that and are more, willing, more than willing to give that responsibility to other people. So on the screen, you can see a Cartesian plane with two specific dimensions. The x-axis, we look at the people versus the task fo focus. So when we look at personalities, is the person more inclined to be focused about the people that they're dealing with or that they're working with? Or are they going to be more inclined to be focused on the task that they have to achieve? So there's a continuum there from left to right, the negative to positive. Uh, on the x-axis, the uh, people focus versus task focus. On the y-axis, we look at the negative and the positive attributes of personality when it comes to being a member of a team. And so if we, we plot that, uh, that Cartesian plane there, we can actually categorize personality types it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's useful for what we're going to try and ex how we're going to try and explain personalities influenced in followership and leadership. So if we have someone who is people focused, um, a negative attribute would be a submissive personality. And we see that in the bottom left hand corner there. That person being submissive allows others to dominate them. They're afraid to object when they see something or when something happens that they consider to be negative. They often have low self-esteem and low self-confidence. Uh, so you may see people like that in your team and you need to deal with that. Above that, we have people focused uh, in a positive way, and that is a supportive person, a person who supports other people within the team. Uh, they will nurture other members of the team and support them. They usually have high self-esteem and high confidence, but because their concentration is is on the people, they're more likely to focus on that rather than on the task. And they're a useful person to have in a team, except you actually do want someone to be able to focus on the task. Now, if we have a look at the negative attributes of someone who is very task-focused, we'll look at the bottom right-hand corner of the, uh, the four categories there, we can see that there's, that person's likely to be an aggressive person. They don't really care about their relationships with other team members. All they want is to get the job done. And you can find that they become short-tempered, snippy, aggressive. They just want to get the job done and they don't care about anyone else's feelings. And then the positive version of that, that's task-focused, is someone who is assertive, that asserts their authority, but they do that by motivating other members of the team to join them in achieving the team's mission. They normally direct the action and they usually have high self-esteem and high confidence. And that's the sort of person that you want as a team leader. You don't want someone who's submissive. You do want someone who's supportive, but uh, and you don't definitely don't want anyone who's aggressive. You want someone who's assertive, that's concerned about the people, concerned about the task, and are able to motivate others to achieve that task. So if you are a member of a team, it's important to understand what personality type you are, where you would fit into that Cartesian plane, and also understand the other attributes and personalities of other members of your team, because you might be the person that's going to be helping one of those submissive persons of the team to get more self-confidence, to get them to be a contributing and vital member of the team. So that's what we talked about. Uh, we just talked about personalities, um, especially in followers. But what about leaders? Let's have a look at leaders. So a leader style, if we use the same Cartesian plane to categorize a personality types, we can see there are different leadership styles that come out of it. And they're all listed there on the screen under those bullet points. We have the first one's transactionals, where you would do something as a follower and the leader will give, make a transaction with you and give you a, a, um, uh, a reward or a transaction. It could be a reward or a penalty. And the reward for the most part is going to be your weekly pay packet. A transformational leader 
someone who wants to transform the individuals of the followers to inspire them and to innovate. A servant leader is one who sees the importance of a follower and does his or her best to make the followers better. They serve the followers who are doing the work. You have a democratic leader who basically, as the name suggests, looks at a consensus, a group consensus to move forward. Autocratic leaders are your dictators. It's my way or the highway. Bureaucratic leaders are the ones that follow the book. They are completely rules-driven. Laissez-faire, from the French meaning to leave alone, leave to do, means a, a boss who allows the workers to do the job, doesn't interfere, but steps in only when necessary. And then you have your charismatic leaders who use the force of their charm and their personality to get people to do their will. None of those are bad, but none of them in isolation is good. You need to be a little bit of a couple, three or four of them, and the, dom the predominant one will be dependent on your personality. Now, this is always very, I have to be very wary with this when I say this, because I, I ask the question, was Hitler a great leader? Uh, did he have an effective leadership style? Now, I'll be very careful when I say this. The word great actually means big or able to do something, as opposed to the subjective term is good. So great doesn't necessarily mean good. Great just means big or large or bigger than anything else. So the question now was, was Hitler a great leader? And the answer is, yes, he was. Was he an ethical leader? Definitely not. Did he cause a lot of misery, hardship, and the deaths of millions and millions and millions of people? Yes, he did. But was he a great leader? If you look at the definition, yes, he was. And the reason for that is he brought Germany out of the depths of an incredible depression. They were broke. And in 20 years, made it into a superpower. In 20 years. So that is a definition of a great leader because Hitler was able to influence people. But he was an evil man. And what he did and what he, the chain of events that he initiated was one of the greatest disasters in human history. But was his leadership effective? Yes, because he was able to influence people to achieve his goals, what he considered to be the goals of Germany. So under no circumstances do I say that Hitler was a, a great man in the subjective point of view. He was not a good man, uh, but he was a, a very effective leader. Now, what about JFK? Now, I know for any of your American audiences, uh, the concept of JFK or the, the aura surrounding JFK may, uh, may kindle some deep emotions. But in actual fact, when you look at his track record, Kennedy was not a very effective leader. He was very charismatic. He was the product of uh, a creation of his father. Uh, he was a product of the media. Um, and like we find at the moment is that uh, people don't like the status quo. They want something new, something fresh. And Kennedy represented something new and fresh. He was only 44 years old when he was elected uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to the White House. And he'd already been a senator for uh, almost eight years. So he represented to many Americans the future, something bright, something fresh. But in actual fact, he was very, very naive. Um, he was a flawed character. Um, he was not, a, not the author that people thought that he was. His books were ghostwritten for him. But people loved him, and his, his popularity uh, didn't dip much below 70%. I would argue that his predecessor, uh, Eisenhower, was a much more effective president, but he was getting old, uh, older than Kennedy. So when people compared Eisenhower with Kennedy, they saw the future as being the young man, the handsome man from a wealthy family, a well-to-do family. So was his leadership style effective? Well, actually, it was. But was he an, a good leader? I would say probably not. He got very few of his policies uh, passed in Congress, and it was only Johnson, his uh, successor, that was able to get a lot of his policies passed, and that was based on the, this is what JFK would have wanted ideal. So people 
voted for them. Uh, they voted for a memory rather than for for the actual policy itself. So what we have on the screen there is a pyramid. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. So Abraham Maslow is a, uh, a psychologist. I think he's from Czechoslovakia. Uh, and he said that in order for the human humans to survive, we need to satisfy our needs and wants. And they have to be done in a particular order, starting at the bottom and working our way up. As you go higher in the pyramid, the needs become wants. So the base needs that we have as human beings are food, water, shelter, and protection, uh, sorry, and good health. Uh, the fifth one there is actually sex. So in the event that we don't have sex, the human race is going to die out. So that's a basic human need is um, the, on shown on the bottom of that pyramid. The next one up is safety and security. So if you think about families and tribes, you know, talking about millennia ago, the only way that you could survive would be to make sure that your tribe was safe and it was secure. That meant things like guarding your food sources, your water sources, your means of reproduction, whatever it might be. So safety and security was imperative uh, after the base needs to be satisfied in order for your people, your tribe, your group to survive. And then after that, we have belonging and affection. So belonging and affection is your uh, the need that we have as human beings to be around other human beings. So if you can satisfy those needs and those wants, you can actually gain a great following in people. So people and their motivations, as you see on the screen, are molded by their cultures and their environments and their physical and psychological needs and desires, and also their sense of belonging. So those last two points I want to bring up. What are their person's needs and wants? And what's their sense of belonging? And if you can satisfy those, you will get a great followership and you will influence people to follow you. So if we go back to Hitler and to Kennedy, what's one of the ways that they were able to influence people? It's in their spoken word. The speeches of Kennedy are very well known. And, uh, you know, ask not what your country can do for you or we choose to go to the moon, or Ich bin ein Berliner. Those words are still considered to be some of the greatest words of the 20th century. Hitler's are not as well known because uh, English speakers don't necessarily speak German, but if you have a look at any of the old newsreels, you see that he was very, very effective in his oratory. Uh, he had a particular way of speaking. He would start off with saying absolutely nothing for about a minute get the crowd all enthusiastic, enthused, wondering what's he going to say, what's he going to say? And then he would start quietly and then gradually build up to a huge crescendo. So both of these men were able to lead effectively, uh, a lot of it based on the strength of their word, on the way that they spoke. But did they write their own speeches? Well, no, they didn't. So if you look at the pictures there, Hitler is talking to his minister for propaganda, Goebbels, Goebbels wrote most of Hitler's speeches. Goebbels was also responsible for making sure that almost every single house in Germany had a radio, a radio so they could listen to de Führer's uh, speeches. Goebbels was also responsible for what was printed in the press. Goebbels was also responsible for what was filmed in their cinemas. And Goebbels was also responsible for what went over the air. So they had complete control over the information that went to the German people. And you can see how effective that was in influencing the German people. On the right there, we have JFK talking to one of his speechwriters. He's, he's probably his primary speechwriter, a guy by the name of Ted Sorensen. Sorensen was responsible for just about all of Kennedy's speeches, all his great speeches. So Kennedy's words came from his brain, Sorensen's brain. But Kennedy delivered them, so people think that they're Kennedy's speeches. In actual fact, they weren't. So these are what I call the men behind the smoke and mirrors, the great leaders of the 20th century, Hitler and Kennedy. Well, yes, they were great leaders because they were able to influence people, but the influences actually, actually came from not just the individuals themselves, their charisma, but came from their words and came from the way that the receivers were molded. Uh, with Kennedy, it was the first real presidency that looked at uh, television as being a platform to get the message across. 
So now let's talk about the F word, the dreaded F word. What is the F word? Followership. As I said before, followership is not a word. And I also said before, it can be a demeaning word. But in a democracy, we need to have followers that follow a designated and authorized leader. But the, the key thing that we have to understand is that being a follower does not mean that you are a mindless drone. Being a follower means you're able to discern what's right and what's wrong and the best way to do things. So if we have a look at this uh, photograph here of the Blob and Voss factory, um, you can see that all the workers there are conforming and that they are showing their respect for their leader, which is, of course, the Fuhrer Hitler. They're all showing their respect. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. Except for this fellow here. He was not impressed. So I think in my books, he demonstrates what a good follower is. Someone who's able to make his or her own decisions and decide whether or not the actions required of the follower are justified or ethical or legal. So that's the important thing about being a follower. So the no stopping for teams technique is all about followership training. So it is a six dimension methodology for the and for enhancing ethical followership, which is basically being a good member of the team. That's what followership is. It can be used by any member of the team, including the team leader. And it helps in doing the following. It manages the team to achieve its goals. It develops individual skills. It removes stress and friction and the problem of interpersonal politics within a team. And make no mistake, friction between individuals usually stems from either a communication breakdown or some politics. And it increases productivity. How does it work? Well, no stopping for teams is a mnemonic. It's a bit of a tortured mnemonic. So the no stands for no, as in K-N-O-W, know your job, become an expert in your job, and then understand enough of the jobs of your team members that you know what their stresses are. And your team member is also your boss, your team leader. Know your job and become an expert, but know enough about other members of your team that you know when they're going to be under pressure, when they're going to be under stress. The ST in stopping stands for stress. So stress, understand what stress is. So you've got physical stress, physiological stress, and psychological stress. The greatest psychological stress that we ever face these days in the 21st century is the perception that we don't have enough time to do the job that we've been told to do. So when we're under stress, we have a physical reaction. We also have a psychological reaction. And one of the reasons why you need to know the jobs of your other team members is you know when they're under stress. And maybe you can do something to help relieve that stress. And nine times out of 10, it's going to be a simple thing as just do your job. Do your job and you reduce the stress of other people, particularly the stress on your boss. And when I say boss, I mean team leader. The OP in stopping is options. One of the greatest lessons I learned in the military is the power of options. So as a member of the team, sometimes you can be the subject matter expert. You could be a specialist in whatever field it is you're doing. And you might be more uh, likely to spot an upcoming problem, something that's going to arise in the future. And so you do your, your, your job and you go to the boss or you go to the team leader and say, hey, boss, I think this is going to be a problem in the future. And then you puff your chest out because you're very proud of what you did and then you walk away because you did your job. But in actual fact, what you just did was you gave a problem to your boss and he's got plenty of other problems to deal with. So you might think that your job is done, but in actual fact, all you've done is just move the responsibility to someone else. What's a better thing to do is to say, hey, boss, I think this is going to be a problem in the future. I think the way to fix it are option A or option B. Okay, so giving the boss options, possible solutions to a problem, goes a long way to helping reduce that stress because the boss may not necessarily be a subject matter expert. The boss has got lots of other things to think about. And so if you provide options, that's fewer things that the boss has to think about. And maybe you can choose one of those options and then the problem can be addressed. 
But probably the better way of doing things is to deliver options and then volunteer to do something about it. Hey, boss, I think this is going to be a problem. We can deal with it with option A or we can deal with it with option B. I suggest option B for the following reasons. One, two, three. Would you like me to look after it? Then the boss can make the decision because there might be some other extraneous circumstances. Maybe option A is actually better um, because of some reasons that you don't know. But more likely, option B, the one that you think is the best solution, is probably going to be the best solution because remember, you're the subject matter expert. And now you've told the boss, you've informed him, and the boss has said, yes, that is going to be a problem. I do need it fixed. You're going to fix it. Fantastic. You've just saved me a lot of stress. And then you go off and fix it. That's probably the best way to deal with it. But it starts with options. Think about the options that you give to other people so they have a choice to deal with something. The ping in stop ping stands for protecting, protecting what's valuable. So the first thing you need to protect is to protect yourself. And I don't just mean physically. That comes from workplace health and safety or occupational health and safety. I'm talking about protecting your job. How do you protect your job? You become an expert at it so that you become vital to the whole operation. How do you protect your future? By cross-skilling. Learn how to do another person's job. Learn how to step into another person's role if necessary. That provides the boss with redundancy. So if you can do the job of your colleague and then your colleague is sick and you're able to step in, that pre presents a lot of flexibility for the boss and relieves a lot of stress. It also means that you become an even more valuable member of the team. Protecting other members of your team, both physically and psychologically. How do you help your other members of your team so that their jobs are saved or maybe their reputations are saved? And whilst we're speaking about reputations, that's another thing that has to be protected. How do you protect the reputation of your team, your organization? Well, first of all, you don't do stupid things like posting TikTok videos that can embarrass everybody. So protect yourself, protect your job, protect your team members, protect the reputation, and protect the mission of your organization. What exactly is your organization trying to do? Uh, here's an example. Say you are fighting a wildfire and you make a huge mistake, and then all of a sudden it becomes uh, the lead story on the, uh, the six o'clock news. That's going to have a detrimental effect on you, your team, and the organization. And then maybe later on down the track, when they're looking at ways to cut the budgets, they remember that that particular organization wasn't very good at their job. Maybe we should start looking around of how we can do the job with another organization or in a different way, or maybe we should divert some funds. So protecting your organization and its reputation provides longevity for the organization. The four in No Stopping Four Teams means forecasting. You forecast what's going to happen. That's situational awareness. Situational awareness comes in three stages. It's detecting uh, stimuli in the environment, so detecting information. Then it's perceiving how, what that means, so understanding the ramifications of that new information, and then projecting it into the future. What's it going to mean to the future? From a physical point of view, wildfire, here's an example. You detect that there's going to be a wind change, wind direction change. Um, you can see the clouds are forming. You know there's a front coming through. It means that there's going to be a wind direction change. What does that mean to fighting the fire? Well, that means that the fire front, the flank, is now going to be the head of the fire. So how does that mean to you and your team? Well, you are currently fighting the flank. You're going to be right directly in front of the head, which is incredibly dangerous. So that's situational awareness, understanding what's going on around you. And that's in a physical sense because we're talking about the environment, the weather, the terrain, etc. It can also be psychological as well. Um, so you look at the psychological environment. What does it mean that this person has been removed from the team? How is that going to affect the morale of the team? How is that going to affect productivity out of the team? So you look at the environment, you be situationally aware, and then you can forecast what's going to happen. And that comes from experience in your job. And the last part is teams, understanding what a team is. So a group and a team are different. A group is anyone that comes together for any particular reason could be a group of people in an elevator. 
A team, on the other hand, are people who are chosen for their particular skills, and they will cooperate and coordinate and use those skills in order to achieve a, a designated aim. So that's the difference between a team and a group. So in order for a team to be a cohesive team, it needs to have that common sense of identity, but it also needs to have uh, a common goal, and it needs to have individuals who understand the skills required for that team. So no stopping for teams um, empowers followers. It empowers them to be better at their job, to be better members of the team, to support a team leader, but also not to be a mindless follower. Now, Qantas uses a thing called the PACE model as part of their human factors training. And PACE stands for probing. So say you're the co-pilot or the first officer on the uh, flight deck of a Qantas flight and you're wondering why the captain has done something. So you probe, you ask questions for better understanding. Then you alert, you inform the leader that his or her actions are contrary to normal practice. So probing, ask questions, alert. Uh, captain, I don't think we should do that. It's not in accordance with SOPs. Then you challenge, you tell the team leader that if they don't change their current course of action, it will lead to an unsafe or an unsatisfactory outcome. Captain, if you don't change course, we will be off course and we will be uh, in danger of hitting terrain. And then final is the emergency warning. You inform the team leader that if you don't take action immediately, then you will take action yourself. So that is the PACE model for um, increasing severity in being a good follower and taking control of the situation when you think things aren't going in accordance with the standard uh, method or procedures or in accordance with safety. So whilst we've been talking about followership, uh, I've actually fooled you. What we've actually been talking about is making good followers into good leaders, but you can also use the no stopping for teams technique when you are a leader. And this is how it works. So no stopping for teams means knowing your job. So as a leader, you should know your job and know enough about the job of your subordinates that you know when to to step in, especially when they're under stress, or to provide them with the resources they need. You understand the team and their stressors, and it helps the leader to be a better manager of those resources. You can also cross-skill, and by knowing a job also means getting your subordinates to know their job and cross-skilling the subordinates, which gives you as a leader more flexibility when you have to start moving people around. It gives you options. You don't want one of your key members of the team to be sick and out of action for a couple of weeks, only to find that the whole team starts collapsing. You need to have that ability for redundancy uh, just in case you need to start moving people around, a succession plan. And if you have a genuine care for your team, you're going to protect the team's longevity because people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. And what I've found as being a team leader is if you train a person to leave, they're going to stay because they've got options, but they like the fact that you were caring about them, so they want to keep working for you as a boss. And forecast likely problems, be prepared to address them early. That's another key aspect of being a good boss. I normally finish off the uh, my no stopping for teams technique by talking about uh, different followers who actually change the course of history. Uh, I won't go into that because we don't have the time, and Mike, I'm sure that you would be start snoring there. But I look at... Uh, three different leaders and I ask people, which one do you want to talk about? And we look at the first ones, the man who prevented World War Three, the man who tried to stop World War Two, and a man who saved thousands of lives in World War One, but no one knows about him. And they were all followers who changed the course of history. So being a follower is not a bad thing. Being a follower is a good thing because being a follower can make you a great leader. So if you want any more information, there's my contact details. Mike, thank you very much for, for uh, humoring me and allowing me to ramble on in conway we really appreciate you coming out today and sharing your uh your time with us and this is such an important topic for everyone and thank you for talking with us about it no it's my pleasure we're doing this for all of you if you like what we're doing please give us a thumbs up hit the subscribe button and leave a comment below see you next time